Think of the early church, God's people, and how they gathered, uh, and sometimes in secret. And I think about how they took 
bread and the cup and how they must have thought about and remember the death of Jesus. Especially when it had not been so long and now things weren't probably quite as good as we see struggles in the early church and as we know happens all the time. But they always could remember Jesus and his death and what that meant to them. And I don't really think it's a lot different today as the world brings us struggles and as we get entangled in busyness and time. We don't really forget, but we sometimes don't think deeply about what really happened. We're lost. And God, because He's always wanted us to be His children and in relationship with Him, He gave up His Son. Who, even more amazingly, He did that for His dad, His father. He allowed Himself to die when He didn't have to. I can remember as a child, always thought. If I'd have been on that cross, people had been jeering at me saying, hey, why don't you come down from the cross if you're really the Son of God? I always thought I'd have had to have jumped down and showed him that he got back up there. He just stayed there and took the humiliation and died for us. And because we do this every Sunday, sometimes it gets kind of old hat. Sometimes we just kind of Take it kind of in a hurry so we won't be late for lunch. But today as we do that, hopefully every time we do that, that we look at the bread and remember the body that hung on that cross. And the blood that flowed from his side and from the thorn sticking in his head. The blood that ironically makes us white clean. And without that, we're all hopeless. And so today, I'm going to give you a minute, a short time before I pray, just for you to kind of be prayerful on your own. And I'm going to pray for you remembrance in the bread and then I will pray again for that give you a little time to meditate on what this really means to us as God's people it's about our father in heaven we come to you today and we confess to you that sin and we are without hope without you and your son Jesus and as we take uh, this bread today may it remind us of the body that he gave as the lamb of God and as we eat it May we remember the hope that that gives us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our Father, we come to you again, and as we 
remember his death on that cross and the blood that flowed. Help us to remember as the blood of the Lamb of Passover was covering the doors and homes of your people. Help us to remember that that blood of Jesus now covers us as your people so that we don't have to die. We can live forever with you. Father, we pray that we would take this in a way that we remember. And we always keep remembering. And giving thanks to you and to Jesus for being willing to do that so that we can call you Father and we can know that we can live with you forever. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Song will be number 76. How great they're all.
fluorescently number in my that have a Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name.
Jill and I came here with our kids about 20 years ago. And I'm already getting that way. But since I'm up here, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to this family for the time that we've been here. Clint, you may have to turn me all the way up trying to get through this. <laughs> we have uh, come to love you and you have come to love us. You have uh, supported us through good times and bad and we, uh, we have enjoyed working alongside you on so many different uh, projects. It has been a blessing uh, to be here and to be a part of this family. And, uh, rarely do any of us get a chance to get up here and just say thank you. So uh, to all of y'all, thank you for that. Helping us raise our kids. Uh, many of you all still have, whether you realize it or not, uh, an impression on uh, Audrey and Reedy both. And thank you for that also. This marks about the fifth or sixth time uh, I think I've been up here to speak, and today is no different from those other times, from the fact that I wasn't told what to talk about, nor was I asked what I was going to talk about. Uh, so that either shows a lot of ignorance or confidence, one of the two. <laughs> I didn't have to submit a, my notes or a copy of my lesson uh, for approval. So having, having cleared the deck on that, have you know that these thoughts and these feelings are, are something my own. And uh, afterwards, uh, if you want to take, take issue or umbrance or whatever it is with anything I say, I'll be, be glad to visit with you about that. Uh, but just wanted to make sure that was also, also clear because what I may talk about may surprise some, if not all of you. The scene took place in a courtroom. And in fact, it was a military uh, courtroom. And the witness on the stand was a highly decorated Marine Colonel. And he was being cross-examined by a young, brash Navy lawyer. And as the questioning went on, the, the the young lawyer became more and more critical of how the uh, colonel was running the operation at the base that he had oversight of. And after a while, you know, the old crusty marine colonel was about half his full of this young kid uh, trying to criticize how he ran things. And finally, he looked at him and he said, young man, have you ever put your life in the hands of another man? and ask him to put his life in your hands. Well, that sure opened his eyes up. Because to consider that on a battlefront, in a situation such as that, the trust and the confidence that those two soldiers in the trench have to exhibit, to trust that this, this one over here is going to protect me, but then also I wear a great responsibility that he's counting on me to protect him. So I can ask a bit of a similar situation to us this morning. Have you ever put your life in the hands of another person? Well, if you've ever flown on a commercial airliner, or if you've ever been the patient on the operating table, or if you've ever ridden the tilt the world at the county fair, <laughs> you put your life in the hands of someone else. Did you ever think about the trust that you're putting in that person's hands? I mean, they're just human, like you. They're bound to make errors and mistakes and have distractions and they have other things clouding their mind besides you and imagine the responsibility that must weigh on the shoulders of those people that that airline pilot has 200 souls behind him that are that are counting on him 
if I needed any other reason not to be a commercial airline pilot, that right there would uh, would, would would get me for sure. Um, so you're in the back of the plane, or you're on the operating table, and and you've come to the to the decision that this person knows a whole lot more about it than I do. Uh, I certainly trust them uh, more to do it than I would. Um, so we, we place a lot of confidence in those people, and yet those people wear a great cloak of responsibility to be in that position. The pilot and the, the surgeon have a wife and kids at home, and, and they're worried about whether the garden or the grass is burning up, and they've got to be somewhere next week for a... And they got all those things, too, that they've got to deal with just like we do. But I'll let me reconsider the question again. Because when I ask that question, have you ever placed your life in the hands of someone else? More than likely, just like me, you probably thought I was speaking of your physical life. You know, as Christians, we speak of this eternal life, this spiritual life, that is far more significant far more important to us than our physical life. So much to the point that some Christians if they had to make the decision between securing their eternal life or preserving their physical life you know, the, the decision uh, is on which one is greater which one is more important. So now let me reconsider let me re-offer the question to you again in a little different way. Have you ever considered the thought of having your eternal spiritual life in the hands of someone else? And to compare with the pilot or the surgeon, could you imagine the weight of the responsibility that would be on that person to have entrusted care of your spiritual life in a way? Well, I contend to you this morning that to a point we had such a thing in six men here in this family. And so I'm going to speak for a few minutes. I haven't timed this out. But I want to speak to you for a few minutes about those six men. And I'm also going to speak to those six men for a little bit. And I want to ask a great favor. I know they're not all here, but Jay, Kyle, Wayne, Lewis, Brad, and Daryl, if you would do me the favor of coming down here and sitting on the front row, I sure would appreciate it. Folks, just like that commercial pilot, just like that surgeon, these men have lives outside of this family community. They have other concerns. They have other things that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we do. But yet on top of all those things, from what I can tell in Scripture, that God, working through His Spirit, spoke to us and had us choose these six men to be our spiritual shepherds, to help protect us, to help lead us. And I wanted to take a few minutes this morning just to recognize for ourselves what a significant responsibility these men have taken on and just to maybe show a little bit of appreciation with them for that. Three things I wanted to hit on uh, particularly. First of all, we've heard probably countless lessons and we've read lots of stuff about how churches are in decline. How church attendance, how church participation and church involvement has been winding its way down for 10, 20, 30 years maybe. And that's not unique to Lamar Avenue Church of Christ. That's not unique to churches of Christ. 
That's churches as a whole. And all the educators and all the analysts and all the psychologists and sociologists have identified this and you know as, as an issue and a problem, but nobody has come up with the magic solution yet. Nobody's come up with this, the perfect strategy. Everybody's trying to resolve it. And so are these men. And that's a difficult thing that I know weighs on their hearts. I mean, they're concerned with this family, but they know we're all struggling in this. And if anybody ever does come up with the strategy or a good strategy or two or three, I feel confident in this, that whatever the answer or answers are, it won't involve what these six men do alone. Whatever the right answer or strategy is, is going to involve more than just them doing something. It's going to take all of us doing something. And then you've got the deal of technology. How many times have you heard people saying in the past years full of so, boy, I would I hate to raise a kid in this environment today, you know, with all the distractions and all the stuff going on. But kids have it so much harder because we got all, all this technology things that's such a distraction. Well, could you imagine being an elder in this time of day? It's kind of this. It's kind of the same challenge. Do you think any of these men here could go on their Twitter account? Jay, you do have a Twitter account, don't you? Or their Facebook account? and post something criticizing, you know, something out there in society or some government policy or whatever. You, you think that they could get away with doing that? <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they've got to shepherd all of us, and, and, but you all are free to do that and get out there and, and put things out there, and, and, and they've got to deal with, the, with what comes up. It's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a, a challenge in this day and age to have to shepherd a society with those kinds of things going on. And then, if it wasn't a more hard enough job as it was, let's just throw in a worldwide pandemic. You know? Now, the decisions they're making involve both our spiritual life and our physical life. And every church, every school, every government institution, every business is trying to decide how are we going to handle this? Do we come together? Do we not come together? Do we do it first with it, you know, with what information we can gather? And these six men have to decide those kinds of things too. I'm glad I didn't have to make those decisions. And just like that commercial pilot, just like that surgeon, I'm sure they'll be free to admit that they make errors in judgment from time to time. If not, their wives will admit it to you. And we've got to bear with them through that. And I think they're humble enough to admit to you when, when they make mistakes, you know, when, when things don't go exactly the way they had hoped. But that's the challenge that they have. So now, I wanted to admonish uh, the rest of y'all with a few things, and then I have one thing uh, in particular to ask of, of you folks down here. The first thing I would ask you all, and I haven't asked them for any input on this, remember. First of all, pray for these men. We all have our, our prayer list, but please, uh, if this family here is important to you, then the leadership of this family here should be important to you, and these men need your prayers. So please do that. Also, communicate with these men from time to time. And don't 
Don't wait till there's a problem to communicate with them. If you, if you have an issue to take up with these men, they're all more than willing to listen to you, but think about it. If, if your interaction with anybody is always when there's a problem, that's, that's not a good way to communicate. If you've ever worked with fellow employees or even your kids, if you've got to mix in you know, the positive along with the critical <coughs> too. So when you want to sh talk to these men, you want to in interact with these men, re remember that uh, you know, to, to admonish them with some, some good stuff too, you know, to, to help build them up and let them let them know that you're, you're supporting them. And then I wrote down here what I'm going to call the 15 minute rule. When we all gather here on Sunday morning, this is a very special time that all the family comes together, but we come together for the purpose of worshiping our God as a family together. And hopefully there's some preparation in our mind and our hearts when we come in to this sanctuary together that our focus becomes our God and our Savior, what we have promised to us. But if in that 15 minutes between when class is over and we come in here, you choose to take that 15 minutes to approach one of these six men with a problem you have, or a criticism that you want to, to level against them, that's, that's not a good time. Because if you think they're going to walk in here now focused on a worship service, no, what they're going to have on their heart and on their mind now is what you just talked to them about out there in the foyer. There's seven days of the week, there's 24 hours minutes. If you're going to say anything to them at all, say good morning, I love you, I'm praying for you. Save, save any issues for some other time during the week. Same for the preacher. Praying for the preacher? Same for the preacher. Same for the preacher. Same for the preacher. Yes. Thank you, Wayne. Same for the preacher. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I want to say one thing. Uh, to our elders. And once again, this is nobody out here may agree with me. This is, this is just Doug Ferris's opinion, okay? But I think as our shepherds, we need, we need to hear from y'all on a regular basis. We don't need to just hear from you when there's a crisis or when there's a big decision to be made. But with some regularity, I think we need you, with all the families together, to just talk to us, to just share with us your thoughts, your hopes, your desires for us. Maybe some of the things that you see down the road that we might need to be considering ahead of time. And if some of you are uncomfortable about being up here, I certainly understand that. We'll get two or three of you up here. I was thinking about the stories that I read in the history books of Franklin Roosevelt and how when this nation was in times of deep crisis, the leader of our country, using technology, gathered the whole country around the fireplace and just talked to us. Just let us know everything was going to be okay and what we needed to be focusing on so the leaders could go ahead and do their business. And I think something along that line from time to time would be very good for this family to hear from y'all. Amen. I'm going to read something from uh, who he says he's a, an, an elder also, from 1 Peter chapter 5. You've got a song picked out, right? We're going to sing, Jacob. Figure out how I'm going to do this. All right. First Peter chapter 5. And now a word to you who are elders of the churches. I too, that being Peter, 
am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Gentlemen, I'd like you to stand at this time if you would and turn and face the congregation. And folks, where you're sitting, we're going to say a prayer. And once this, when I say amen, Jacob, feel free to start the song. We'll go from there. If you would, wherever you're sitting, uh, just reach out with your right hand and extend a hand of blessing to these men. I'm going to say a prayer of blessing over them. I appreciate you participating with me. Father God, we believe in your inspiration to us through the Spirit. We believe that you have committed these six men to us to lead us. You know the struggles and the difficulties that they have uh, doing this. And we pray you give a double portion of your Spirit upon them. We pray that we as a family will, will recognize uh, their leadership and will try to work with them and not against them, that we will be inspired by, inspired by their example. And Father, we just pray that together we can all try to move closer to you and expand the kingdom of God here in this place. We pray all these things through your son's name. Amen. Amen. Here I labor and toil as I look for a home. Just a Oh, oh, oh.
I'd like to thank you for letting us gather here and, uh, and sing songs to your name and hear a portion of your word. Just thank you for this congregation and the encouragement we receive from it, uh, from each and every one of uh, you in it. Uh, just thank you for the eldership and the, the leadership and the guidance they provide. Uh, just help us to, as Hebrews says, to, to support them and, and make their job a, a joy, not a, not a burden, Lord. Be with us as we part in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.